This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. Good morning, I'm John Trout. It's Wednesday, August 7th, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Vice President Kamala Harris has chosen Minnesota Governor Tim Walz as her running mate. I'm Mike Hempen. Republicans were quick to criticize the Democratic vice presidential pick. I'm Shelley Adler. Incumbent Missouri Representative Cory Bush has been defeated by St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney Wesley Bell. I'm Norman Hall. Debbie moving slowly through the southeast, bringing more flooding and more deaths. I'm Clayton Neville. Another assassination attempt against former President Donald Trump has been stopped. I'm Pamela Furr. On Wall Street, stocks are coming off a winning day after Monday's plunge as investors bought stocks on sale. I'm Jessica Edinger. All ahead on America in the Morning. Vice President Kamala Harris announces her vice presidential pick. Correspondent Mike Hempen reports. St. Anselm College political analyst Chris Galdieri says presidential candidates don't often pick governors as running mates. It's very unusual for a Democratic nominee to pick a governor for a running mate. Um, If you go back all the way to Harry Truman, uh, Democrats almost always pick a senator. Moments after Harris's VP pick became public, former president and Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump said Walls would be the worst vice president in history, claiming the Minnesota governor would like trillions of dollars on fire and open U.S. borders to criminals. I'm Mike Hempen. Members of the Republican Party were quick to react to the announcement of Minnesota Governor Tim Walls' placement on the 2024 ballot. Correspondent Shelley Adler has that story. While former President Donald Trump said Minnesota Governor Tim Walz would be the worst vice president in history in an email, GOP vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance spoke to reporters before a rally in Philadelphia and criticized the pick by Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris. This is a person who listened to the Hamas wing of her own party and selecting a nominee. This is a guy who's proposed shipping more manufacturing jobs to China, who wants to make the American people more reliant on garbage energy instead of good American energy. And he thought they make a good tag team. Tim Waltz allowed rioters to burn down Minneapolis in the summer of 2020. And then the few who got caught, Kamala Harris helped bail them out of jail. I'm Shelley Adler. In other 2024 election news, incumbent Representative Cori Bush from Missouri has lost her re-election bid. Correspondent Norman Hall explains. Incumbent Missouri Representative Cori Bush has been defeated by St. Louis County Prosecuting Attorney Wesley Bell. In June, another squad member, Representative Jamal Bowman, lost to George Latimer, a pro-Israel centrist. Bell's campaign received a big boost from the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, whose Super Political Action Committee, United Democracy Project, spent $8.5 million to oust Bush. She was targeted after repeated criticism of Israel's military response to the October 7th Hamas attack. Bush responded by saying that the donors behind APAC support former President Donald Trump and other Republicans. I Norman Hall. The top stories of the day are sponsored by Sleep Number. Sleep better together. Save 40% on a Sleep Number limited edition smart bed. Only at a Sleep Number store or sleepnumber.com. When we return on America in the Morning, arrest made in Trump assassination attempt after these messages. This is America in the Morning, Hurricane Debbie, the human toll. First, here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Latroy Thornton with the forecast. Tropical Storm Debbie is over the Atlantic Ocean this morning to the south of Charleston, South Carolina. The storm is expected to meander eastward this morning before making a curve to the north later today, making its second landfall in South Carolina during the early hours of Thursday morning as a tropical storm. From there, the storm should track across eastern South Carolina through the day Thursday, slowly gaining forward momentum as it crosses into North Carolina by the evening hours. From there, interactions with a cold front to the north and west will give Debbie a greater push of speed, and the storm is currently projected to track from central North Carolina and Virginia into south-central Pennsylvania by Friday evening before racing northeastward into far northern Maine during the day on Saturday. 
along the path of the storm. Wind gusts generally in the 40 to 60 mile per hour range can be expected from southeastern Georgia through the nation's capital and into southern New England and along the coast from the Carolinas through Maine. In terms of rain, a zone of at least one to two inches of rain from Debbie will stretch from Georgia northward through central West Virginia through Saturday, with a widespread four to eight inches of rain most likely from central parts of the Carolinas and Virginia through eastern Pennsylvania and perhaps far southern Vermont. Otherwise, look for showers today from Pennsylvania and New Jersey southward to the Mid-Atlantic, where some thunder will be possible as well. Showers and some thunderstorms also are expected to build from the upper Midwest and northern plains into eastern Colorado, with spotty afternoon storms across most of the southwest and into parts of Wyoming and Montana. In Los Angeles, look for sunshine mixing with clouds today with a high of 88. In Minneapolis, clouds will build through the day today with a stray afternoon thunderstorm around and a high reaching 76. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Latroy Thornton. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. At least six people are dead as Tropical Storm Debbie continues to drop torrential rain on parts of the southeast. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. Two teenagers among the dead, five deaths in Florida and one in Georgia, as Debbie brings the chance of catastrophic flooding from Florida to the Carolinas. We've had a heavy impact on southeast Georgia with heavy winds and certainly a lot of rainfall. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp. Our assets are continuing to be staged and our personnel are embedded in uh, local emergency operations centers in the affected areas. We've got the Department of Public Safety, Department of Natural Resources, Forestry Commission folks, Georgia DOT teams ready to deploy and are being deployed right now in affected communities. The threat of heavy downpours expected to last through the week as the slow-moving system moves north. Some areas could see 20 to 30 inches of rain. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says conditions are still dangerous in his state. Big impacts in Sarasota, Bradenton from flooding, that is still ongoing. We are going to see more flooding in northern Florida. Uh, These things take time as the water comes down. You're going to see these rivers rise. You're going to see the tributaries rise. That's just inevitable. How much? We'll see. Debbie expected to make a second landfall after moving off the coast and back onto land. That thought to be near Charleston, South Carolina. River flooding across the region, a major concern today. I'm Clayton Neville. The FBI arrests a man they say was trying to assassinate former President Donald Trump. Here's the latest from correspondent Pamela Furr. A Pakistani national in custody who has ties to Iran on charges he plotted to kill Trump and other public officials. Criminal complaint was unsealed on Tuesday, and although it does not mention Trump by name, ABC News says the former president was one of the intended targets. They say that he was able to stop him because one of the people he contacted was an actual FBI informant. According to court documents, after spending time in Iran, a Sif merchant flew from Pakistan to the U.S. to recruit hitmen to carry out the plot. He was arrested one day before Trump's July 13th rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, where he was shot in the ear. Investigators say they have found no connection between this assassination plot and the man who pulled the trigger in Butler. I'm Pamela Furr. When we return on America in the Morning, the most expensive cities to buy a home after these messages. Welcome back here with America in the Morning. The Business Report is brought to you by Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments has a team of specialists in investing, financial planning, estate planning, and more. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. Uptick in the markets yesterday. Here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after stocks rebounded from Monday's plunge, clawing back some of those losses. The Dow was up 300 points. The S&P and the Nasdaq gained 1% each. This sort of concentrated panic was done. We're back to the end of the first quarter levels in the S&P. A lot of stuff really did wipe away months worth of upside. So that's just the way it goes. CNBC's Mike Santoli. And some investors say the 
economy is doing just fine. What is the economy? What is it doing? It's growing about two, two and a half percent. Atlanta Fed is at two nine, whatever that is. It's not recessionary. And I look at the consumer. We all look at the consumer because it's really super important. And there's some tailwinds for the consumer because it's important. Gasoline prices are down 10 percent in the past year. Mortgage rates are the lowest since April of 2023. Inflation is at two and a half percent. Hightower's Stephanie Link on CNBC. Credit card debt hit a record in the second quarter. Research from the New York Fed finds that credit card balances rose by more than five percent from the same period a year ago. Credit cards come with interest rates now on average of more than 20 percent. Disney is raising streaming prices for Disney Plus, Hulu, ESPN Plus, and bundles. The increases start in October. Most plans will cost a dollar or two more per month. Disney also plans to crack down on password sharing. That starts next month. Uber shares were higher on stronger than expected quarterly results. Airbnb shares plunged last night after the closing bell on an earnings miss, and the company is warning of slowing U.S. demand. Jessica, you've got the list of most expensive cities to buy a home. Yeah, this list is based on how much someone has to earn to be able to buy a median-priced home in that city. Mortgage Analytics, uh, the firm HSH, compiling a list of the most expensive U.S. cities to afford a home and the salary you need to buy in that market. Number one most expensive city is San Jose, California. Mm. Necessary income of more than $463,000 to buy a median-priced home. The median priced home there, $1.84 million. Average income needed across the 50 most expensive cities is 104000 well above the U.S. median household income of $74,000 or thereabouts. CNBC's Tyler Matheson. On today's watch list, we get earnings from... Disney and CVS Health, Hilton, Lyft, Sony, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Robin Hood. We also get another report on consumer credit today, and it's day two of congressional hearings on the Boeing Max door blowout on that Alaska Airlines jet last January. CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Well, it was a banner day for U.S. track and field at the Paris Games. Correspondent Gethin Coolball reports. The Americans won two gold medals and five overall in track and field on Thursday at the Paris Games. Cole Hawker pulled off the upset of the track meet with a stunning victory in the men's 1,500-meter race. Hawker won the race in an Olympic record 3 minutes 27.65 seconds, pulling from fifth to first over the final 300 meters to beat his personal best by more than three seconds. The 23-year-old is only the second U.S. man to win the metric mile at the Olympics over the last 112 years years, American Jared Nagus came in third to take home the bronze. Gabby Thomas blazed her way to an easy win in the women's 200 meters in 21.83 seconds. The 27-year-old Harvard graduate took the lead for good at the curve and was never challenged in the final stretch. American sprinter Brittany Brown won the bronze. Annette Echikowoke won silver for the U.S. in the women's hammer throw. I'm Gethin Coolbaugh. When we return on America in the Morning, the latest on that U.S. military aircraft crash after these messages. We're back on America in the Morning. More details are coming out about the cause of a U.S. military Osprey crash off the coast of Japan last November. Correspondent Lisa Dwyer reports. Documents obtained by the Associated Press show that a gear crack that led to the fatal crash of a V-22 Osprey last year may have been started by weak spots in a metal used to manufacture that part. The crash off the coast of Japan killed eight Air Force Special Operations Command service members. It was the second time in less than two years that a catastrophic failure of a part of the Osprey's prop rotor gearbox, which serves as its transmission, has caused a fatal accident. In 2022, five Marines were killed when a different part failed. The Osprey can speed to a target like an airplane, then rotate its engines to land like a helicopter. But some components have worn down earlier than the military expected. Investigators are still investigating. I'm Lisa Dwyer. A college stadium in Florida will soon have a new name. Correspondent Margie Zaraleta has details. 
I'm a fireball. Pitbull will pay $1.2 million annually for the next five years to Florida International University to name its stadium after himself. Pitbull says Pitbull Stadium, home of the FIU Panthers, is truly history in the making. The deal calls for him to get used to the stadium for 10 days each year with tickets set aside for students. He also gets two suites and 20 VIP parking passes for FIU football home games, and he will create a new anthem for the school. I'm Archie Zaroleta. America in the Morning for Wednesday, August 7th, 2024, is produced by Alexander Hinton. Our senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. Vice President Kamala Harris has her man. I'm Clayton Neville. A surprise gold medal for the U.S. in track and history made by a Cuban wrestler. I'm Steve Futterman at the Summer Olympics in Paris. The judge in former President Donald Trump's hush money case delayed the date for a ruling on presidential immunity. I'm Ed Donahue. Hamas in a bold move showing it refuses to back down to Israel. I'm Bob Brown. I'll have that story coming up. Once again, Disney is raising the prices on its streaming services. I'm Kevin Carr. America in the Morning, back after these messages. You're with America in the Morning. Welcome back. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist LaTroy Thornton with today's forecast. The center of Tropical Storm Debbie is over the Atlantic Ocean this morning to the east of Savannah, Georgia. Through today, Debbie should continue to crawl very slowly to the east before making a curve to the north by this afternoon, with a second landfall expected along the South Carolina coastline during the wee hours of Thursday morning, perhaps between Charleston and Myrtle Beach, still has a tropical storm. Storm total rainfall of 4 to 8 inches and wind gusts of 40 to 60 miles per hour should be widespread from southeastern Georgia into the Carolinas and much of eastern Virginia with the highest rainfall totals of 12 to 18 inches and some pockets of up to two feet of rain expected along the South Carolina coastline where wind gusts also may approach 80 miles per hour. Devastating flooding is still possible if Debbie slows down more than is anticipated, but widespread flooding will be expected regardless. As Debbie gets a push to the north later Thursday and into the weekend, tropical downpours and enhanced wind gusts will travel with it into the mid-Atlantic late this week and eventually New England into Saturday. Tropical storm force wind gusts of 40 to 60 miles per hour will again be possible along a swath stretching from central Maryland through most of New Jersey and southern New England to the coast of Maine as a general 2 to 4 inches of rain covers all but the most interior sections of the northeast through Saturday. Getting back to the rest of today's weather, showers can be expected near and to the north of a cold front from northern Pennsylvania into New Jersey, with some steadier rain ending in southern New England and some thunderstorms south of the front into northern Virginia. Showers and storms extend along another cold front tracking across the northern plains and the upper Midwest, with more spotty afternoon storms from Montana to the Four Corners states, as most other places remain dry today. That's the weather across America. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist LaTroy Thornton. Remember, follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. I'm John Trout. Vice President Kamala Harris and her pick for VP in the bid for the presidency are now touring the country as they officially launch their campaign. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. The governor of Minnesota started his Tuesday by taking a phone call. Hi, this is Tim. It's Kamala Harris. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Madam Vice President. I want you to do this with me. Let's let's do this together. Would you be my running mate and let's get this thing on the road? I would be honored, Madam Vice President. 60-year-old governor and former U.S. congressman from Minnesota, Tim Waltz, being painted as a far-left progressive Democrat, as pointed out by former President Trump's VP pick, Republican Senator J.D. Vance. My view on it is it just highlights how radical Kamala Harris is. This is a person who listened to the Hamas wing of her own party and selecting a nominee. This is a guy who's proposed shipping more manufacturing jobs to China, who wants to make the American people more reliant on garbage energy instead of good American energy, and has proposed 
defunding the police just as Kamala Harris does. Vance told reporters that Harris and Waltz make an interesting tag team. Because, of course, Tim Waltz allowed rioters to burn down Minneapolis in the summer of 2020. And then the few who got caught, Kamala Harris helped bail them out of jail. So uh, it, it is more instructive for what it says about Kamala Harris, that she doesn't care about the border. She doesn't care about crime. As Republicans blame Waltz for the destruction after the 2020 killing of George Floyd in Minnesota, Vice President Harris officially launching her presidential campaign at a raucous rally yesterday in Philadelphia. I stand before you today to proudly announce I am now officially the Democratic nominee for President of the United States. Wolves being welcomed by Democrats with approval from President Biden and support voiced by former President Obama, even Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who was in the running for VP and spoke at the Philadelphia rally. Governor Waltz brought the energy that he's known for to the stage and went after his opponent. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, <laughs> had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! That's not what middle America is. And then he added, I can't wait to debate the guy. That is, if, you, if he's willing to get off the couch and show up. So. The governor went after Trump, too. You know it. You feel it. These guys are creepy. And yes, just weird as hell. That's what you see. That's what you see. He insisted to the crowd that America will not back Trump. So you know what's out there. So say it with me. We aren't going back. We're going back. And they chanted. We are not going back. I'm Clayton Neville. The Justice Department is saying they've foiled an Iranian assassination plot inside the U.S. Correspondent Norman Hall has the latest. A thief merchant allegedly traveled to New York in April for the purpose of hiring hitmen, even paying a $5,000 advance to the would-be assassins who were actually undercover law enforcement officers. He was arrested last month before he could leave the U.S., and the plot was foiled by the FBI. Court documents do not identify any of the potential targets, but the case was unsealed just weeks after U.S. officials disclosed that a threat to Donald Trump's life from Iran prompted additional security in the days before a Pennsylvania rally last month in which Trump was injured by a gunman's bullet. The shooting was unrelated to the Iran threat. Norman Hall, Washington. A surprise finish in the men's 1,500-meter track event at the Summer Olympics. Correspondent Steve Futterman reports. At the track stadium here in Paris last night, two gold medals for the U.S. One was expected, the other was a shock. In the women's 200-meter dash, Gabby Thomas was the favorite, and she easily beat the field. There is nothing like walking into a stadium of 80,000 people, and they're screaming, and they're right on top of you. Um, that is a lot of pressure to, to put on someone, but it's also it made it a lot more special when I crossed the line as a champion. But in the men's 1,500-meter event, no one expected American Cole Hawker to cross the finish line first. That's exactly what he did. Every part of me knew that this was uh, the Olympic final, and uh, <laughs> if that makes sense, I felt the moment, I felt the magnitude of it, and uh, it, was, it was incredible and uh, just... I knew what I had left. The U.S. now has 24 gold medals, two more than Cuba, and Americans are in positions to get more. The U.S. women's soccer team advanced to the gold medal match with a win over Germany. The men's basketball team is in the semifinals after a win over Brazil. Devin Booker led the U.S. with 18 points. And in Greco-Roman wrestling, Olympic history was made yesterday. 41-year-old Cuban Mijain Lopez Nunez won his fifth straight Olympic gold medal in the 130-kilogram category. No one has ever done that before in any Olympic event. I'm Steve Futterman at the Summer Olympics in Paris. More on the Olympics with our Robert Workman and sports coming up. When we return on America in the Morning, U.S. Navy responds to Mideast tensions and a new leader for Hamas after these messages.
This is America in the Morning. I'm John Trout. The sentencing date in President Trump's New York hush money case has been pushed back. Correspondent Ed Donahue reports. The immunity decision was due September 6th. Judge Juan Marchand scheduled sentencing for September 18th. The judge now delayed the immunity ruling to two days before the sentencing on the 16th. A jury found Trump guilty in May of falsifying business records to conceal a deal to pay off porn actor Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Trump denies Daniels' claims, maintains he did nothing wrong, and says the case is politically motivated. His lawyers say the case should be thrown out after the Supreme Court's July ruling on presidential immunity that some testimony came from Trump's time as president. The Manhattan DA's office maintains the high court's opinion has no bearing on the hush money case because it involves unofficial acts. I'm Ed Donahue. The U.S. Navy is increasing its presence in the Middle East as tensions in the region grow. Correspondent Lisa Dwyer following details. About a dozen Navy F-A-18 fighter jets from the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier have flown to a military base in the Middle East as part of the Pentagon's effort to help defend Israel from possible attacks by Iran and its proxies and to safeguard U.S. troops. The fighter jets and a Hawkeye surveillance aircraft arrived on Monday. A squadron of Air Force F-22 fighter jets is also on the way. In recent weeks, Iranian-backed Iraqi militias have resumed launching attacks on bases housing U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria after a lull of several months. A strike on a base in Jordan in late January killed three American soldiers and prompted a series of retaliatory U.S. strikes. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Hamas has a new leader. Correspondent Bob Brown has that story. CNN breaking in with the news yesterday. Hamas, as in the last few moments, announced that Yahya Sinwar will replace Ismail Haniya as the group's political leader. Sinwar, of course, is the group's leader in Gaza. Hamas has named Yahya Sinwar its new leader in Gaza in the wake of the assassination of his predecessor, Ismail Haniya, after an assumed Israeli strike on Iran. Sinwar allegedly was the mastermind of the October 7th attacks in Israel, which killed more than a 1,000 people, with nearly 250 being taken hostage. The region at the moment is a powder keg, with both sides digging in, bracing for more attacks as negotiations continue in an effort to gain the release of the hostages. A Hamas spokesperson says Sinwa would continue ceasefire negotiations. Hamas's allies, Iran and Hezbollah, issuing statements praising Sinwa's appointment. AP reporting U.S. Secretary Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Sinwa has been and remains the primary decider when it comes to concluding the ceasefire. Sinwa has been kept out of sight since the October attacks, which triggered Israel's campaign of bombardment and offensives aimed at destroying Hamas. In May, prosecutors at the International Criminal Court sought an arrest warrant against Sinwa on charges of war crimes over the attack, as well as against Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and and Israel's defense minister. I'm Bob Brown. A Chinese-American man has been convicted of giving intel on dissidents to the Chinese government. Correspondent Julie Walker reports. A Chinese-American scholar has been convicted of U.S. charges of using his reputation as a pro-democracy activist and the founder of a pro-democracy group in New York City to gather information on Chinese dissidents and feed it to his homeland's government. A federal jury in New York delivered its verdict Tuesday in the case of Xu Xuyin Wang. Prosecutors say Wang lived a double life for over a decade at the behest of China's main intelligence agency. He pleaded not guilty and his lawyers portrayed him as a gregarious academic with nothing to hide. Julie Walker, New York. A man accused of threatening a mass casualty event at a college football game last year is now in federal custody in Arizona, awaiting extradition to Rhode Island. Andrew Buchanan is accused of calling the threats in by cell phone before the Army-Navy game December 8th. According to a criminal complaint, the FBI reported receiving a tip that Buchanan allegedly told a family member they would see him on the news and there would be a mass casualty event at the stadium. The Army-Navy game was played without incident, and authorities were able to track the call. 
Buchanan is also accused of making threats to shoot up the campus of Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island, a few days after that football game. A student admissions employee reported the call. Prosecutors said Buchanan is facing one felony count of interstate threatening communications, which carries a maximum penalty of five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. America in the Morning continues. The CEO of X, Linda Yaccarino, has filed a lawsuit against multiple advertising advocacy groups, accusing them of trying to demonize the social media platform. Chuck Palm has that in today's tech report. X, formerly Twitter CEO Linda Yaccarino, announced Tuesday the company has filed a lawsuit against the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, accusing the advertising group of illegally boycotting companies, including X and other social media outlets. Yaccarino had this to say on a video on X. The evidence and facts are on our side. They conspire to boycott X, which threatens our ability to thrive in the future. That puts your global town square, the one place that you can express yourself freely and openly, at long-term risk. Yaccarino went on to say that X filed the suit after reviewing the House Judiciary Committee's recent investigation that found evidence that Garm and its members directly organized boycotts and used other indirect tactics to target disfavored platforms. Video sharing platform Rumble announced they would be joining the lawsuit. Garm claims to be apolitical and voluntary. Comment at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. Here's your check of midweek sports with our Robert Workman. The White Sox beat the A's 5-1 last night to finally end their 21-game losing streak, which tied for the longest ever in American League history. Jonathan Cannon allowed six hits over six innings, and three relievers set down the side in order down the stretch. Andrew Benintendi belted a two-run homer for Chicago, earning a W for the first time since before the All-Star break. Framber Valdez came within one out of a no-hitter for the Astros in their 4-2 win over the Rangers. A ninth-inning homer by Corey Seager broke up the no-no and the shutout, but Valdez impressed his manager Joe Espada. He's going to get the ball. He's going to go out there, and he's going to he's going to go for it. You know, Framber breaking ball. He sinker. He was efficient, and you know, got into a little bit of trouble there. And but he was he was really good all night. The lefty got his 11th win of the season with last out help from Josh Hader, who has now converted 23 straight save chances. Brewers blanked the Braves 10-0. Colin Ray and Joe Ross combined on a six-hitter. Willie Adamas launched a pair of two-run rockets. Padres shut out the Pirates 6-0. A three-hour rain delay ended the start for Dylan Cease after just one inning. But five relievers picked up the slack after they rolled up the tarp, and Donovan Solano had four hits and four RBI. Reds rolled over the Marlins 8-2. Another four-hit night for Ellie Dela Cruz. Phillies down the Dodgers 6-2. Edmundo Sosa and Kyle Schwartz Schwarber with back-to-back jacks. Cubs trampled the Twins 7-3. Isak Paredes socked one out and drove in four, while Shota Imanaga allowed just two hits over seven innings. Red Sox shaded the Royals 6-5. Masataka Yoshida with a homer and three RBI. Two-run taters in the second by Victor Scott the second and Tommy Pham lifted the Cardinals over the Rays 4-3. Blue Jays beat the Orioles 5-2, scoring all of their runs in the sixth. Nationals spotted the Giants a four-run lead, then roared back for an 11-5 route. James Wood homered, tripled, and scored four times. Tigers sank the Mariners 4-2, and the Rockies doubled up the Mets 6 Three. Angels and Yankees, Diamondbacks and Guardians both rained out. Both have doubleheaders today. The first week of NFL preseason games begins tomorrow with the Lions at the Giants and the Panthers at the Patriots. New England no longer pursuing a trade for 49ers receiver Brandon Ayuk, according to ESPN. The Browns and the Steelers have made offers for the second-team All-Pro. That's Wednesday Sports. When we return on America in the Morning, new report on the mental health of high school students after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. House of Mouse raises its Disney Plus pricing. Correspondent Kevin Carr has details. Disney is increasing its prices again on its streaming services. Most users will see a hike of about $2 per month for each service. Disney Plus is essential for Marvel fans. I have an army. We have a Hulk. And with Deadpool and Wolverine, along with Pixar's Inside Out 2, pushing the studio's worldwide theatrical grosses across the annual $3 billion benchmark, more content will be coming. Let's give the people what they came for. This is a big change for the last two years, which struggled with flops like Lightyear, Strange World, and The Marvels. That was the plan. Not a great plan. 
Disney is hoping consumers will bundle services for a price break. The ads tier bundle of Disney Plus and Hulu will increase $1 to $10.99 per month, a $9 savings on both services sold separately. Other increases include a dollar more for ESPN Plus and six bucks more for Hulu with live TV. Disney will also be adding playlists soon, similar to how traditional cable works. The ABC News Live playlist should capitalize on the election cycle, and a preschool playlist will save parents the need to browse and search. Marvel and Star Wars playlists will be added this fall for premium subscribers. New pricing will go into effect on October 17th. I'm Kevin Carr. Promising news in a survey of the mental health of high school students. Correspondent Shelley Adler reports. A government survey shows that there are small signs of improvement in the mental health of this country's teenagers. But the share of students, particularly girls, feeling sad and hopeless, remains high. From 2021 to 2023, the portion of high school students who reported feelings of persistent sadness or hopelessness declined from 42 percent to 40 percent. That's according to the CDC report. More than 20,000 students were surveyed at school in the spring of 2023. Among the girls, the percentage reporting persistent sadness or hopelessness fell from 57 percent to 53 percent. I'm Shelley Adler. America in the Morning for Wednesday, August 7th, 2024, is produced by Alexander Hinton, our senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. <laughs>